All right, it's recording. Excellent. So this is our second session on Augustine's City of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a little sampling from two and three, uh, books two and three, uh, in this first part. Yes. Four, seven, I think, and eleven. Am I missing something? Uh, there was two chapters from five, and then it was eight, not seven. Oh, five, five, five. Oh, eight. Yes, I should put that down. The Roman numerals are all. <laughs> um, there we go. No seven, is that right? No seven, yeah. Okay, so, um, let's get into it. All right. Um, yes. <laughs> so... I think I have the most to say about the last, like, 8 and 11. Okay. All right. Um, well, then why don't I... Look, want me to start with... Because I, I made some notes on... Yes, go for it. Okay. Um, so, in 2... So, we just did a couple of sections in 2, 1, and 3. Um, and then... I need to take a look at my 5 notes. But... So, for 2, um, you know, there's a little bit of a review and then uh, of what he's been doing in book one, which we covered last week. And uh, I did note that there, it, there seems to be this uh, recurring uh, push on Augustine's part to remind the reader why he is arguing. So there, there's an element of repetition, but I imagine, I mean, he's not an idiot, so I imagine it's for rhetorical purposes um, and emphasis. But I did note in book two, he does talk about, in section one, he does talk about sort of um, the, the minds of essentially the uh, unfaithful or the, the non-Christians, uh, that they're deluded and um, thus making it hard for them to see things correctly. I know Augustine is a big proponent of um, I mean, obviously he's a Christian, so, but he's a big proponent of uh, original sin as outlined by uh, Paul in his epistles. And I know, too, that Paul emphasizes this, and I know later the theology emphasizes this, that the part of the original sin is not just a per propensity or proclivity toward evil, but also it affects our understanding such that we're not seeing things correctly. And I, I, I just thought it was interesting to note that, um, you know, he's, he's writing this as a, you know, an, a, a defense, if you will, of the city of God, as a response to the barbarian attacks. But in so doing that, he's sort of reminding that, you know, whatever the reader, and uh, I guess the rest of us, that in so understanding his arguments, the frame of mind could very well be affected. Mm -hmm. So we're not seeing things rightly. I imagine you're familiar with that too. Sort of that, that notion of original sin is not just a, not, it's not just that it affects our choices and decisions, but it also affects our thinking. Sure. Um, and then he reiterates in that sort of first section about sort of, and this is why we, you know, have to, whatever, we're making all of these arguments to uh, make our position, you know, crystal clear uh, on this. Um, he, he, in section two there, he, he revisits the uh, question two, why did these divine blessings extend to the godless and the ungrateful because the barbarians were um, providing refuge not only for Christians, but also non-Christians. So that's posed again, which we covered last week. Um, and then in 29, I started in this section because, uh, for, or for this, the reading for this week, I started to highlight attributes of the city of God. Like what, 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 what are its characteristics? And, um, in 29, he really, okay, it's actually, I don't know if you remember this, but he's actually like very, it, it's, um, uh, forceful in his call to, as you remember the language of waking up, it's time to 
to wake up, mm-hmm. to wake, and very exclamatory, uh, called a holiness, uh, which I thought was just interesting because the rhetoric shifted a little bit, um, and it sounded very much like a sort of a preacher in, in that sense. Um, but the one aspect that I got there was that he refers to it as the heavenly city in 29, and he uh, equates it with truth. And I'm not going to jump on to the other traits because those come later. Um, but I, I was um, just, just just in trying to get my handle on his his sort of heavenly regime, as it were, uh, especially compared to Aristotle's and Plato's, which is a little bit more clear. Mm-hmm. I th- you know, I mean, we finished their books; we're still in this one. Um, I thought to note that it's like, okay, so one trait of the city is that it is founded on truth. Yeah. And there are more to come, but... In 29... responses? Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at it right now. Um, so right after he mentions the heavenly city, um, which for victory you have truth, um, he mentions uh, those who are... Pro- propitiated by deeds of shame are unworthy of the worship of the right-hearted man. Um, mm-hmm. And also, let's see, what is it? Uh, those men were blotted out from your citizenship by the censor's mark. Um, so I think, I mean, I guess I guess these other kind of uh, virtues tie into the, to it. Um, Mm-hmm. But it's like uh, it talks about. So you said truth, but um, tr- like I'm trying to think. Um, is is truth just like what is real, or is it much more mm-hmm. than that? You know, like is it? It's probably yeah. it's most likely talking about moral uh, truth as well, because um, mm-hmm. it includes dignity, holiness, peace, uh, felicity in that um, section. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the... Um, I've always sort of understood truth within a religious context or within Christianity to be much broader than how we define it in logic. Right. You know, log- logic or, or even philosophy or, or even science or everyday notions of truth. Like basically, truth in those spheres relates to statements. Mm-hmm. And a statement, if true, um, corresponds to reality, right? Um, so I am sitting outside having this con- conversation with Christian. Uh, is a true statement because it represents, it reflects those facts of where I am positioned, who I am talking to, so on and so forth. But my notion of truth in religion and uh, with, in Christianity is, 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 is sort of broader than that. I think it deals with statements and their connection to reality, but I also feel like there is, um, you know, like for instance, um, uh, Jesus re- refers to himself as the truth. Um, now, is that, you know, truth in his person? Is that, that doesn't seem to be just what he says. Um, the, you know, it, it could be the whole system or the whole gospel. Uh, right message mm-hmm. is, is is truth in the sense that it's um, uh, yeah I guess you know, real it is salvific um, it sets you free you know that so you know and we normally don't think about like like I, I want to say that there's sort of like this poetic and broader metaphysical notion of truth as it relates to Christianity as opposed to it being just reduced reducible to statements. Yeah, it kind of makes me think yeah. um, about uh, it, so in in chapter eleven is where he kind of talks about um, the the creation and the separation between the world and like eternity. Kind of makes me think mm-hmm. that like what logic and science say is true is is very confined um, yeah. to the world that we are in, but the mm-hmm. truth that that this is talking about is like kind of goes that step beyond just the world that we're in. Right. Yes, 
exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, and, and, and the other thing, and I'm, I'm getting this from the uh, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It also, is, there is an element of um, sort of this is it, it's all it's truth as a um, as a focus. It's truth as a lifestyle. It is truth as um, your guide. You know, mm-hmm. um, and and yeah, I think it's more, basically truth as more as more inclusive of other aspects, uh, including true statements, right? Right. But um, but other other elements, even like you said before, uh, morality. Um, you know, because that it's always perplexed me. Like, how could how, how could you be the truth? You know, like, how do you even understand that statement? And it's got to be beyond um, sort of a, a, you know, a simple notion of logic and propositions, you know. Yeah. And truth, t- and truth tables. <laughs> um, and just a couple comments about book three. I did think it was interesting... We only read uh, section thirty-one. That he's referring to sort of hardships that were endured in Rome, but before the advent of Christianity, so before the gospel, before Jesus came, mm-hmm. before the gospel was delivered, and, um, and and that's a nice argument of peace, right? If you're going to argue that the uh, sack of Rome. Um, if you're a place of the of the sack of Rome, this recent sack of Rome on Christianity, um, what do you say about other uh, atrocities in the past or other attacks in the past, right? Yeah. When Christianity hadn't even arisen. So, you know, like, you're not really being consistent here. Who would you point the finger, the finger at then? And uh, for him, he obviously says that the only gods that you could blame at that point would be the pagan gods. So taking another, you know, sort of hit against the, um, uh, well, two things, the logic that's being employed, and also uh, the pagan gods, which in five, or four, and, and I think he mentioned this before, but before he's pretty explicit about what these pagan gods are, which are evil spirits and demons. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got, uh, you know, a I mean, I guess we could add on to this that the earthly city, as it were, is going to sort of have this... I mean, I want to be careful. I don't want to say it's like demonic, but it's, you know, it's going to be run by the baser part of ourselves. It's going to be affected by original sin. And I would imagine as well, it will be uh, tempted, as it were, by the demonic. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Um, um, so, um, did you, oh, you had, you had, you had yeah, some stuff to say at the, at the end. The other thing for was, um, this one reference to, I don't know the, um, author, but, uh, at Puglia, from his work De Mundo, this is in section two, where he actually then referenced Apulia about the long quote in section two, um, he, he quotes him from his text. Um, but he's using this source as all of these ancient authors do, right? We see the Plato, we see the Aristotle, always quoting other you know, authorities. Um, but he even uses him as a proof, as it were, that uh, all of these atrocities are the result of the pagan gods. Um, this is on, uh, yeah, section two, there's like a sort of cutout, uh, or inside quote. And, uh, he says at the end, basically he talks about all of these quote-unquote conflagrations or problems. And he says it was a con- yeah, conflagra- con- conflagration kindled by the gods. So this is a Puglius even pointing this out, you know, um, that this 
fiction authors attributing um, these sort of negative occurrences to the painting gods. Mm-hmm. So using yet, yet sort of another argument, so you know, that whatever, I, I imagine maybe he was somewhat revered, um, but yeah. Yeah, it seems like um, he's calling uh, he's calling the pagan gods uh, demons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that's part of the quote, but I think that's what he's responding to after. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I see it. But also, in, in good argument of mimetic fashion, you're using sort of, you know, a Roman author. So, and, and these authors, it should be said, um, hold some authority, right? I mean, you're not going to really quote someone, even today, um, unless, well, unless you're trying to get it from the horse's mouth so you could be criticizing the person. But also, this is, uh, you know, as it were, sort of an expert. And, and one of the, you know, one, one of your own is is pointing to the gods mm-hmm. as being the cause as being the cause of these problems. Um, so, did you remember the section about the two families, the two people, the two realms in section three here? Uh oh, I do remember. Oh, wait, I do yeah. remember reading that. Um, it was an interesting image. Which he doesn't always utilize, but but he's yes, yeah, sort of striking an analogy. Yeah. Um, hold on. What is the context before that? Um, he's right. Before before that, the paragraph, he says, is it reasonable, is it sensible to boast to the extent and grandeur of empire? I mean, you cannot show that men lived in happiness as they passed their lives amid the horrors of war, amid the shedding of men's blood, whether the blood of enemies or fellow citizens, under the shadow of fear and under the terror of ruthless ambition. So this seems to be a question about uh, happiness within the empire. And then he turns toward the... Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, let us assume one is poor, uh, or rather middling mm-hmm. circumstances, the other very rich. Mm-hmm. Anxious and discontent. Yes, yes, yes. So he's, yeah, he's drawing this opposition um, between the qualities of two different men. Um, mm-hmm. And, and then Doug, mm-hmm. is, he, is he attributing one to the city of the man and the other to the city of God? I'm sort of feeling the poor is going with the city of God, the rich is going with the city of man. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just look at the rich, tortured by fears, worn out by sadness, burnt up with ambition, never knowing serenity of repose, etc., etc. The other man, content with his strictly limited resources, loved by family and friends, enjoys the blessing of peace with his relations, neighbors, and friends. So, and you can sort of think about the, you know, there is no empire that's poor, <laughs> right? Um, I would probably say that that would be true in the history of empires. So, we're equating the empire um, or the city of man with the, the rich man in this analogy that, you know, you know, you know, has all of this power, but at the same point, it's not, it's not serene. Is not enjoying the sort of a, a, a true sense of peace or the happiness that comes from, uh, you know, relationships. Whereas the poor man, uh, you know, the, the poor man is obviously going, you know, if you have friends, man, they're, they're real friends because they're not trying to get to them. <laughs> right. And uh, if you're the rich man, they're probably trying to get your wealth. If it's the powerful man, they're trying to get close to the power. Um, and so you're, you're more of a tool, whereas the poor man is more of an end of itself. If you have a relationship, if you, if you have a relationship with him, um, and he even says in the next paragraph, um, he says that, uh, yeah, we will see where true happiness lies. Um, so, 
point here is sort of getting back to, and I guess you can start to attribute this then to both cities, that the city of Man is ultimately not going to really get at happiness, which is interesting when you compare that to Aristotle, right? Because food ammonia, flourishing, um, you know, you, you do want to become a good citizen, but the goodness within Aristotle is ultimately pointed toward mm-hmm. food ammonia. It's ultimately pointed if the sum of bonum is happiness, right? Right. So you could, whereas this is not happening within uh, the city of man. So the flip of that, then, city of God, the attribute would be, uh, he uses the word felicity, at least in my translation, um, of, of genuine happiness. You know? And also the poor piece reminds me of Jesus, it reminds me of the apostles. It reminds me of a lot of Jesus' message about the poor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that it's it's ultimately those that are going to get the kingdom of God because they're, um, yeah, they're, they're not they're, they're not hung up on you know the, the acquisition of wealth and all of the sometimes problems that can come with that, right? So, um, you mentioned Aristotle and his view of eudaimonia, but Aristotle doesn't have this idea of two different cities, right? Correct. So, Correct. In, his, more, yeah. in his view, it's more like um, there is an opposition between this ultimate happiness and then whatever is not that, right? So, you're trying to move from one spectrum to the other by achieving that. Um, so, maybe, like, to compare the two thoughts... It's like um, you're walking between the city of man and the city of God um, in, in in the Aris, um, Aristotelian way. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. I mean, I can, the, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, there is no you know, sort of dualism that we find here, but we find both Plato and Aristotle comparing to other regimes, mm-hmm. right? And whether or not those regimes will actually lead to uh, wholeness, let's say, or order within Plato, or ultimately uh, a virtuous life um, within Aristotle. Um, but what's interesting about the virtuous life is that you can, Aristotle, you, you can constantly push him, yeah, well, why have the virtuous life? Why? It, and it's going to end at happiness. You know, um, but at least if you're looking at it through the, uh, the window of the ethics, I think I can safely say that would be true of the politics as well. You know, at least for the individual. I don't. I don't. I don't know if he's going to comment on the city as a whole, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but at least for the individual, as I am, you know, operating with the virtues within the city and I'm politically active, I am becoming more virtuous. But why? You know, ultimately to to seek some type of happiness. And I, and I think it's an interesting commentary too with it, with Augustine here. Because if you look at um, whatever, you can look at the uh, United States in 2020, and um, and possibly other decades too, right? At other time periods, and you know, sort of ask yourself the question whether or not there, there is some form of true happiness, you know, and and certainly in 2020, um, the evidence isn't there. Mm-hmm. You know, with, with with division, with acrimony, with you know uh, protests, with um, you know sort of the uh, uh, the fighting that goes on within politics and with, with those who follow various parties. Um, so happiness is like an interesting one to sort of like consider, you know. And and my sense is that for, for uh, Augustine, you're just never going to get happiness in the age. City of man, it's just—it's impossible mm-hmm. because there's there's so much spiritually against that. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether or not we can figure out whether the citizen of the city of God who lives in the city of man <laughs> can experience happiness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really relegated relegated to bliss in the afterlife. Right. So, I mean, at the end of this, what, uh, chapter three of book four, right? Yeah. Um, 
uh, he ha- okay, he says, so therefore the good man, although he is a slave, is free, mm-hmm. but the bad man, even if he reigns, is a slave. Um, yeah. And then he quotes a verse from Peter, which says basically the same thing. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of this interesting idea where the the bad man is is like this the a ruler um mm-hmm. but ultimately they're kind of they're hurting the moms, their own selves um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so they aren't they aren't free in that sense um it kind of makes me think about the the tyrant in the platonic uh like division of yeah, governments right like they That's become they become dependent on all the people around them and they have to like shut themselves out um mm-hmm. and have people protect them um just <laughs> just to survive basically like they they might have started out being someone who's who is liked at first um but then yeah. over time they just they kind of uh, faded away and had to be under that protection a slave to the people entirely yeah entirely you know, I mean, and also too, what's interesting with that phrase, "the good man, though a slave, is free." I mean, obviously it's witty, mm-hmm. but also the good man, though a slave. So where is he a slave? He's a slave within this particular regime. Mm-hmm. Um, is free, um, ultimately because uh, he's not bound, as it were, to the vices. You know, mm-hmm. so, um, you know, the, uh, it, it's just, it, there's an interesting paradox there. Um, right. Yeah. And then the reverse, the wicked, though he reigns. Um, so he's in charge, he's ruling, he's got the power, is, is ultimately, yeah, is ultimately a slave. Yeah. It's really a question of what um, are you a slave to? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because well, it's interesting too because the end of that is the, he is a red, I'm sorry, a single man. But what is far worse, the slave of as many masters as he has vices. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Um, so that that yeah, in, at least in this context, it would be um, slave to his vices. Yeah. Um, so it's another trait that you can put down to the city of God is not only happiness, uh, but virtuous living, and then also freedom, right? Mm-hmm. Which is very, which is very much like a, uh, like a, a, a Christian notion that comes out of the original text in terms of like the truth will set you free, right? Um, it's sort of like the spiritual freedom because you're not burdened by the vices. Yeah. Um, just, I'm going to breeze through five, but he does reference Constantine and uh, Theodosius. Uh, Constantine is the one that did make Christianity uh, legal among uh, three legal religions. So at that time, Constantine was uh, still allowing Roman paganism and Judaism. And then it's Theodosius that gets the... Um, credit, as it were, for um, making Christianity the sole religion and banning the other two from the empire. Mm-hmm. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't highlight there. He's saying some other things there. Um, but he has very positive things to say about both of them, which yeah. would, shouldn't surprise us. Right. So, um, what do you have on... Do you want to take up 8 and 11 a bit, or what because uh-huh. I've got someone eight, but I agree, I have some on both. But right, can you prime eight? <laughs> sure, eight. We've got this is all the um, uh, basically the use of Greek philosophy to discover God. Yeah, and I thought it was a relevant section to include because of our reading of uh, Plato and Socrates. Also, too, I mentioned last week that um, he leans more toward. Uh, Platonic thinking than it was Deuterian. Um, so it was interesting to see his use of it. I would say this too. I, I, I appreciate this about Augustine that even though he is um, so very much a Christian, 
and so very much a Bible believing Christian. I really appreciate his use of, as it were, pagan philosophy. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I, I think it's interesting, um, and I, I imagine if he if we question him on this, it would be because uh, as he sees the Platonic philosophy of getting at truth um, with a capital T, and whether or not it knows it, mm-hmm. and um, also we could go back to this notion we talked about last week of common grace, right? Um, God allows the sun to shine on both the righteous and the wicked. So God is allowing, as it were, intellectual blessings for Plato and Platonists. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing. But nonetheless, I, I, I appreciate it because it's, it's not an all-out ban on anything pagan or anything that smacks of paganism. Um, just real quick there, he, he references uh, the pre-Socratics. Um, these were more by names. He doesn't call them the pre-Socratics, but a group of philosophers uh, that come before Socrates. And they're pra- they weren't so much interested in the question of how ought we to live, but they were more interested in the question of what is there and why. So their study was uh, basically physics and natural science as they understood it at that time, and pretty much trying to get back to a first cause of all that exists, or the ground of being, like what, what is, like what's behind everything that exists. These are interesting philosophers. There's they're, they're, they're a whole series of them, um, and the sort of philosophy starts with them, um, but they, uh, they're they much more metaphysically oriented um, about like what what is. Um, reality and what what is it made up of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he brings up how Socrates uh, changes, even though he has a metaphysics, he changes the focus to ethics and emphasizes morality um, and ultimately the highest good. Um, and, and and Augustine ends up you know, stating that there are areas of agreement with Plato, that he, he shares areas of agreement with Plato. Um, and that, I'm uh, quoting here, the Platonism is basically superior to other man-made theologies. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my one question that I had that was a little... Uh, I, I wasn't sure if this came from the Neoplatonists, because there was a school of Neoplatonists um, uh, that had more of a spiritual, religious emphasis than... Than Plato, although Plato, it could be said, has some notion of spirituality. But he, Augustine, straight up equates the form of the good with God. Yeah. And I, that was, I, I, I was just like, I mean, he even says at one point that, uh, it, this is in uh, seven, he says that um, to be a philosopher is to love God, which is an interesting spin on uh, the etymology of philosophy, which is the love of wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I thought it was interesting. I didn't know if there was, and we would both have to do more research on, you know, Plato. But my understanding of Plato is that the form of the good does sound like a god, um, right? It's in the sense that it's all creating, it generates everything from it, as it were. It's the ground of being without the form of the good. There are no other forms, there are no other things, you know. But um, to equate it with, the personal God of the Judeo-Christian tradition, I was sort of seeing this was an addition, you know, um, or maybe he's saying this is something Plato didn't see, as it were, <laughs> but I do, you know. Wait, what do you um, mean in an addition? Well, it, 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 the that he equates the form of the good with God. Augustine does that. Yeah. And he seems to be saying that this is how Plato understood it. Mm-hmm. That's the part that I've slight contention there. I'm not saying that the form of the oh, can't be God. So, okay, so you're saying Plato... that um, Augustine is saying that Plato thought that God was the form of the good. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Not that he thought there's... himself, but Plato did not. No, no. Okay. No, no, no. Exactly. No, no. Um, and obviously Plato is like hundreds of years before Jesus. Um, that's okay. It could be the case that the way divine revelation works is that Plato picks up something that ultimately is, you know, 
um, confirmed further uh, by uh, uh, the gospel message, message from the lips of Jesus. But that part was interesting because I felt like uh, a careful reader, a careful reader might take issue that Plato actually saw it as a god, and by a god I really mean like a personal god, as opposed to like an impersonal force or ground, you know. Um, and that's my sense of the form of the good. It's much more impersonal. It doesn't have thoughts and ideas and desires and other other sort of person's traits. You know? mm-hmm. um, so, uh, well, it, it, that that Plato that Plato holds that's my issue. That Augustine thinks that the form of the good is God. That's okay. That's his answer. You know. Yeah, I think, and I think we talked about this before. I don't know if it was one of the ones we recorded or not. If it was before that. Um, but I had mentioned that when we were reading those those aspects of the good, um, I attributed it to the Christian God as well. Like I feel like yeah. it, it pretty greatly explains certain aspects of it, right? Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you mention it being or it seeming uh, less personal. Because I feel like that makes sense, right? It's like, oh, it's this Mm -hmm. abstract, the good is this abstraction of everything else, um, the the purest form. Um, But it's also the purest form of, like, wisdom and morality, um, which I feel like that, that encompasses, like, that encompasses what you would call, like, the, the personal aspect of God. Yeah. Um, Totally. Right? No, I, I, I see that. I do see that, but the the when, when we think about like the, the traits of the Judeo-Christian God, you 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 have the notion of this is a personal God as opposed to an impersonal God, and by that it, it's not just those features of morality and and wisdom, right? That, that I, I totally see that, but it's also a being that, like us, has. Um, desires, motivations, hopes, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I don't see those, as it were, psychological traits, if we could say that, being a part of the form of the good. Right. I can understand um, that. I feel like, yeah. um, maybe I'm projecting a little here, but I feel like yeah. a way that you could maybe explain that is that this idea of the good more so represents God the Father than the other two parts. Yeah, sure. Sure, um, and like like totally. the personal parts really are you know the Holy Ghost and the Son. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that aligns with 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 um, certain verses. Yeah. Oh, let me say this: I totally think that if you had to, you know, uh, if you, if you if you were looking at an ancient philosopher and an ancient philosophy, and you were seeing like similarities between Christianity and those, mm-hmm. you'd certainly find it like Platonism easily. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't. I mean, you know, you just you wouldn't find it with Aristotle. And Aristotle has a notion of God, which is really interesting. We never we didn't cover it because it didn't come up. But his God is so unlike the Judeo Christian God. Mm-hmm. His God is basically a explanation um, that he needs to include as to why things why why things in a state of potentiality ha- uh, arise to a state of actuality. In other words, why things sort of develop. And so, because uh, he, he, part of his metaphysics is to see things in a state of potentiality, the acorn, that ultimately uh, evolve into full actuality, the oak tree, right? Mm. Um, and so he he doesn't know he said, what's the engine ultimately that's moving those things, and then he end up, he ends up coming with the notion of God that he calls the prime mover. So it's a thing that's in a fully actualized state. That is the that that essentially draws all that's in a state of potentiality into actuality. Um, however, the part and that could sound like part of the generic Christian God in terms of power, right, or creative, um, you know, energy. Mm-hmm. But the he goes on to define that God as, and you'll love. I've always loved this definition as thought thinking itself. Mm-hmm. And he defines it that way because uh, this God in a fully actualized state of being is 
outside of time. And mm-hmm. if he's outside of time, then he can't be contemplating anything that's in time. So the only thing that he's contemplating is itself. And, and that one, I would say, is far less personal, right? Right. Um, it just it sounds like, you know, it's sort of a necessary piece in a machine to get the machine to work, you know? Right. Um, but uh, so I would say, yes, out of all the ones, Platonism is there. It's, I, I'm, I'm it's sort of splitting hairs a little bit about the... Augustine saying that Plato sees it as a god. Um, but my reading of Plato, I might be missing something, you know. Um, could be other other texts that get at that notion. Right. One final word, and then I'll let you jump into 11. Um, and we've seen this throughout book one and, and, and uh, the other books that we've read for this week, but in, um, in this, in, in age, there is another mention, a couple of mentions of the body. And I think it's important as we continue to think about Augustine, is that Augustine has, and this is also very platonic, that there are problems with the flesh. And he brings this up in this book, uh, age, because he's pointing to pre-Socratic and also other philosophers um, that when they did their thinking, they were looking for something material to root it in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as they had bodies they and, and therefore were physical, they also were, uh, their philosophies, as it were, were based on some type of physicality. Um, and, and there's a long, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work done on Augustine and the body. We see this in Paul as well. You know, and, and it's tricky because, like, the body at some level is good because it's a creative thing. And Augustine would certainly say that, right? Um, because he believes that God, you know, we, I think we talked about this last week, but the notion of the uh, solving the problem of evil, that everything in its essence is very good, you know? So he can't really say that the body is evil, but he can say that the... Uh, the body can lead to temptations. Um, the body, like Aristotle or like Plato, it distracts. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's just interesting to to uh, to bring that up and keep an eye out as we continue to read. Uh, but his theory of the body is an interesting notion, um, and it doesn't. I wouldn't say that it really gets praised that much. Right. Um, that sort of spirit is pure, also very Platonic. Um, and yeah, the, 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 but this one's interesting because he doesn't, he's not saying that the flesh is leading to sin per se. He's saying that the flesh is, uh, so framing these philosophers thinking that they have to look for something physical to root their philosophy. In. Um, so it's an interesting extension of the problems of the body. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense why he favors Plato then, <laughs> if Clearly. if all of these are rooted yeah. physically. Also, I think in this section, he mentions the difference between the soul and the body, and yeah. while he doesn't yeah. really ne- necessarily have an explanation for the origin of the soul or how the soul is connected with the body, um, mm-hmm. he definitely makes that distinction. Um, yeah. I don't even know if he tries to tackle tackle that question the connection yeah like yeah, he just one. he just knows it's connected <laughs> <laughs> yeah somehow that's a hard one it is you know. all right book 11 yes uh, i got a lot here but i'll let you take the lead on this yes hold on a second um or i asked that you take the lead on it yes um so book 11 um so it starts out with, let's see, the, the origin of the and the end of the two cities. And mm-hmm. this is where we get to um, this idea that we've already mentioned, I think, twice now, of the, like, the, t- the timeliness of the world. 
Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. how God is outside of that time, and yeah. how people try to describe that as uh, if you extend an eternity beyond the beginning of the earth and beyond the end of the earth, uh, or the, this world, universe, um, that you can't really just like you, like why you you have to ask the question is like why did it start at the time that it started um yeah. but instead of instead of trying to take this this notion that that um there was time before and after um he kind of explains it that you know there there is this division between um god and the universe um mm -hmm. like we're yeah. we're we're a subset we're contained within him to a degree, yeah, um, which is a very platonic thing to say, but mm -hmm. it's like it's because he's beyond time. We always try to like, and because we are very bound by time, we are always trying to mm -hmm. describe things in terms of motion or space or time. Sure. And that's why it's so hard <clears throat> to think about. It. It's like, oh well, obviously there was something for eternity before us or after us. Mm -hmm. Instead of being like, oh, time is just like this one aspect of this universe, and um, in reality, it's like our universe in all of its time is just like a bubble, um, mm -hmm. and God can see, you know, all of it. Um, totally. Kind of like how we have, we watch YouTube videos or, you know, things like that, and we can observe any moment of that video, um, and it does have a starting time, and it does have an ending time, but we we are we exist beyond that right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so it's yeah. interesting that you're bringing this up with the, the because the um in other areas specifically in his confessions he actually has a theory of time it's mm -hmm. interesting with all the, the sort of like uh um original to augustine and uh, uh, theories like his one on uh, the problem of evil right right um but he has one that actually deals with time. He has a theory of time, and one of the, and, it, and it's very interesting because he says ultimately that the uh, um, that time. So we break it down in terms of past, present, and future, and that actually past and future are uh, illusory; they're not real. Right. So mm -hmm. the only thing that exists, as he sees it, is the present. That the only thing you ever. The, the only the, the only time you ever do anything is in the present, mm -hmm. and past as a time, as, as a sort of a temporal location or sphere, and the same is true of future, um, is problematic um, because he doesn't really see it as a place to go to. Right? I, I'm not going to the future. I'm not going to the past. He's not thinking about time travel here, so we can't include that. But he uh, he says that. Um, the only yeah the only thing that's real is the present, and that what past really is is just memory in the present. Yeah, and all that future really is is expectation in the present. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can sort of include that, you know, with his notion of you know uh, the eternal God. But he does make a very strict distinction between. Um, God in eternity, God outside of time, um, and uh, we as sort of time-bound uh, beings. Yeah. Um, let's see. Which I think connects then to his city of God, right? Yeah. The city of God is eternal. You know? Yes. And, and, and I'm wondering whether or not we're only going to see the city of God in moments, in glimpses, right? You never see it in its in its pure eternal form until the afterlife. Yeah, um, I think that's so blessed, fair. You know, but you you probably just see sort of like snippets in the here and now, sort sort of like Plato's notion of justice. You'll never see pure justice mm -hmm. unless you reach the form. But you'll see, you know, the shadows. Um, yeah, you, exactly. Well put. Yeah. What I got from this section, this is when I started to do my list. Um, and these are all from yeah, this uh, book 11. And these are traits of the city of God. So I got glorious, this is all in one. Mm -hmm. Glorious, 
um, compares it to a holy mountain, which has images in terms of holy set aside, mountain like sort of up above. Um, uh, I like this one too. This one's really good. Spreading joy over the whole earth. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, to think, to be a citizen of a city that can do that is, uh, is, is a wonder. Uh, Eternal, which we've just been talking about. Mm-hmm. He also says we can become citizens of the city of God. And, um, and one of the marks of these citizens is delighting um, or taking delight in the worship of God. Um, flip that, citizens of the earthly city, uh, he says at one point, prefer their own gods, which we've heard before. You know, we can add yep. all the other traits onto that. Um, so just, again, trying to get a bit of a handle on his, his ideal city, as it were, I thought that those were some interesting traits to highlight. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. Wait, uh, what was it saying? Uh, I just saw this part in the first chapter. Um, mm-hmm. it, it says, let's see, let me go to the beginning of that. Oh, that's a long sentence. Holy cow. <laughs> I was reading right the long one. Yeah, I was trying to read the beginning or the middle of a sentence. I was like, where does this begin? Um, well, the part I was looking at says, and and who would rather worship God than be worshipped as God. Um, so the pious is the holy gods who are better pleased to submit themselves to one than to subject many to themselves. So it sounds like he's comparing a citizen of the city of God and one of man and like the the city of man wants to be worshipped as a god, mm-hmm. is that mm-hmm. is that what that's saying? Give me the uh, I'm trying to see the section. It's in one, right? It's in one towards the end. Like middle, okay, towards the end. Like really towards the end. Uh, like the second, third to last sentence. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is this uh, um, so? Is this where he starts out with my task is to discuss? Uh, I'm trying to find the rise, the development, and death and end of the two cities. Yes, that's that's that section. Yeah, yeah. The earthly and the heavenly, the cities which we find, as I have said, interwoven, as it were, in this present transitory world, and mingled with one another. Right. Uh, I'm trying to find where that exact part is. Yeah. Okay. This, what I just read, is literally, it's, just, it's like right before the next section. Oops, hold on. Uh, right before the next section. Uh, the part right before the next section is about... The differences arose among the angels. That's what my, this one says. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the sentence right before. Yeah. And, I, and first I shall explain how the beginnings of these two cities arose from the differences between two classes of angels. Yeah. Right. So it's so it's, what was, what, yeah. it's two sentences before that. I, I got Ah, uh, okay. Mine's, it looks like it starts with, to this founder of the holy city... Uh, the citizens of the earthly city prefers their own gods, not knowing that he is God of the gods, not false, impious, proud gods, being deprived of his unchangeable and freely communicated light, and so reduced the kind of poverty-stricken power. Uh, yeah. Yep, I see it. Their delight is to worship God rather than to be worshipped yes. instead of God. Got it. Um, so I guess one of the traits of the city of man is, uh, I mean, I'm sensing there's, there's a, a pretty big, like, um, what's the word? Opposition, like that you're going to see opposite traits in the city of man and in the city of God. 
So mm -hmm. this one is kind of, of the city of man, is very uh, selfish or self-centered. Um, sure, exactly. Whereas the opposite would be said of the city of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we, I think we may have talked about this before, but like humility mm -hmm. being a, a trait of the city of God. So you don't have that there. If you want to be worshipped, obviously you're not humble. Um, and uh, um, yeah, no, I think that's fair. I do want to conclude. We probably should conclude soon. All right. That last sentence in one is great. So when he says, "My task," so just a little further down, my task is to discuss to the best of my power the rise the development, and the destined ends of the two cities, cities the earth and the heaven. Mm -hmm. The cities where, I'm sorry, uh, we find, as I've said, interwoven, as it were, in the present transitory world and mingled with one another. So, uh, um, hopefully we'll be getting more of this in the next two weeks, but the I, I just thought that it was really packed, you know, uh, the, you know where, you know, how they came to be, how they've developed over time, where their ends are, and we're talking about both at this point, um, and also the interwoven element, right? Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, it, it'll, I guess what intrigues me about it is that, you know, we just don't have this with Plato and Aristotle. It's like once I come up with my ideal city, you know, you're there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But the, and that's one big distinction is that you're not going to, with Augustine, this ideal city, yes, it exists, but it's not something that's realizable in this lifetime. Um, for Plato, it was very much realizable in this lifetime. I mean, well, seemingly, right? Um, uh, well, with Plato, it was a lot of, of a thought process. <laughs> I mean, it was realizable in that sure. you could enact it. Well, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I, in other words, I don't, you know, I, I don't think he's just going through an empty exercise with the development of his, his utopia. Yeah, um, I think if you pressed him on it, he would say, "Yes, we could build this. It might not be perfect, but yeah." You know. So that's what I think. What's interesting here is that you know, at the start, Augustine is not like there is no utopia, as it were, right? There, there, there is no utopia here on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not going to happen. And that makes a political theory very interesting because it, it raises questions about, well, what am I supposed to do, right? Um, I'm, I'm constantly yearning for this other city, um, yet what what is my role to the, the, the city or the, the state or the empire that I'm in? Um, so I, it. I think with, 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 this creates like a, a very interesting problem for us as, as we think about his system. It's not a bad problem. It's, just, it's a very interesting one, actually. Yeah. No, I think you, you kind know. of touched on it, too. Um, like, you said that we can't, we can't realize the wholeness of the city of God um, yeah. because it's kind of, it kind of is this abstract form or, mm -hmm. you know, in the form of the good. Um, so we're only going to see pieces of it where we mm -hmm. are now. Um, and yeah. that kind of the, the explains that. The, yeah. the interesting thing, though, is I'm sure that Augustine at some point, and he himself abided this way, is going to feel certain obligations for the earthly city. So that that's the interesting thing. It's not as if you are some, like, you know, zombie in the earthly city, only focused on um, the heavenly city, mm. right? Right. There will be obligations. There will be obligations, and I mean, it could be as simple as those obligations to the city, to the earthly city, need to be in concert with the traits of the heavenly city, right? Right. So in other words, like you, know, you, know, you want to be charitable, you want to be humble, but but nonetheless, there is a question about what type of you know. There's questions about allegiance, um, uh, you know, loyalty, um, patriotism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are those all become very interesting. Um, you know, because I, I I would imagine he wouldn't want to say that you are, you know, you're just tolerating everything in the here and now um, right. as a citizen of the heavenly city. That you no, know, you do have some role. What is that role? You know, and maybe we see it by what he's writing, mm -hmm. and by the, I'm sorry, the fact that he's writing, not just the content. You know, sure, like. The, 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 the like I said earlier about him, like you know, calling everyone to uh, a 
awake and, you know, it, 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 maybe the role is the spread of the gospel mm-hmm. and the, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the changing of hearts, minds, and souls, you know? Definitely. Um, but that still doesn't answer the question, am, do, do I have obligations to this earthly power? That, that, that I, I want to see how he unpacks that, because that's, they might not be ultimate, but are they, do they even exist, you know? Right. You know? Yeah, I mean... Uh, also, too, if God is fully sovereign, then is he instituting these powers, even if they are corrupt? Mm-hmm. Justin leans on the side of, uh, at least according to some readers, like a very strong, almost reformed notion of sovereignty and predestination. Um, you know? Right. So so there's a question about if he did institute them, um, you know, what, you know, do, do, are we still paying unto Caesar what is Caesar's, as it were, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting. Um, Because we've got, um, like, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning, the original sin, um, Mm -hmm. and this idea that, like, we are bound by the world in our senses and in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So it will definitely be interesting to see how he unpacks that further with the idea of the body and the two cities and duty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think it's uh, it's it, it. This will be probably easily the, at least among the books that we're reading the most unique. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. as all the other ones I imagine. Even though Hobbes, as I mentioned before, has notions, Christian notions, strewn throughout his theory, um, this one is um, yeah. This one, this one's unique in the, in the dualism in the two cities, right? Mm-hmm. As opposed to the, the one ideal one, or you know, our own, and um, yeah, that 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 that's basically the ideal city that 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 you would want to be a part of isn't even here yet. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, uh, good, good, awesome, Christian. Yep. Good discussion on uh, election week 2020. <laughs> that's right. We'll keep an eye on it. Oh boy! <laughs> All right, buddy. We move on to we got two more weeks on this. I looked at the readings, and I think we're good on those. So. All right, cool. Sounds um, good. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what happened, but uh, I don't want us to read too much. But I do want us to read. <laughs> make sure we're getting enough. Yeah, absolutely. Understand. Awesome. I appreciate it.